Hello, and welcome to our first lesson for Chemistry 30 Online. Um, so today we're going to be looking at the introduction to energetics, which is what our unit will be about. Um, so specifically today we'll be looking at an introduction to enthalpy. So our curricular outcomes for today um, are being able to, hold on a second here guys, sorry I just want to get my pen set up properly. Um, so being able to define enthalpy and then we're also going to be looking at kind of like a variation on that which is molar enthalpy which is um, just looking at the enthalpy for like a specific amount of something um, so you should be able to define those four chemical reactions um, then you should be able to write balanced equations which hopefully <laughs> if you're in chem 30 you can already do but the new thing we're adding in chem 30 is that included in your balanced equation you should be able to have energy changes written in there um, so choosing the appropriate whether it's a reactant or a product for endothermic or exothermic reactions um, the other thing you should be able to do is we're going to look at this delta h notation so this is basically just like the formula way of communicating um, information about em energy changes in chemical reactions. So being able to use that notation to communicate energy changes is what we want to look at with that. And lastly, we're not going to get to it today, but using calorimetry, um, so that's kind of like the experimental method that we use to look at energy changes in chemical reactions. So use data from, you know, like fake, I guess, calorimetry experiments basically to determine the enthalpy changes that are happening. So we'll be doing some calculation work there. So thermochemistry is the study of energy changes. Um, so how energy is produced or observed or absorbed, sorry, by a chemical system during a reaction. Um, so in order to study energy changes, because we want to be able to really measure how the energy is changing, ideally we would want to have an isolated system. Um, so if we, an isolated system is basically one in which neither matter nor energy can um, enter or leave. So basically that means that if we have energy changes happening in a reaction, in an isolated system, all that energy would be able to be measured because none of it would be lost to the environment. Um, however, it's impossible to make a perfectly isolated system. So usually we're using a closed system instead, which is like the next best thing. So just a bit of a review of what these systems are is um, chemical systems. We have three types. Just one thing to kind of be aware of as well, because as we move forward, we'll be talking a lot about this term systems. So just being aware that when we're talking about a system, it can be, it can kind of be anything. It's basically just we pick what the system is. Um, so it's the thing that's being focused on usually. Um, so let's just highlight that object being focused on. Usually for us in Chem 30, that's going to mean a particular chemical reaction will be our system. Um, and then the surroundings is another thing we'll look at, especially when, when, you get it, when we get into calorimetry. Um, and so that is going to um, just kind of refer to basically everything other than what we're focusing on in terms of the system. So there's three types of systems you would have learned about back in Science 10. The first one is an open system. So basically it's illustrated by this jar of iced tea on the right where the lid is off. And so basically matter can come into it because it's open and energy can also come in and leave because if you were to leave that sitting out in the sun, we know that it would get hot. And if say you continue to leave it out and nighttime falls um, and the air cools down, then we're going to see that the iced tea is going to cool down as well, which means that energy can leave as well. In a closed system, it's basically like you still have that same jar of iced tea, but you've just closed the lid. So still you know that that liquid can heat up and cool down depending on what's happening in the surroundings, um, but no matter is coming or going from the jar. 
Lastly, we have an isolated system, which is where neither matter nor energy transfer are possible. So this is like the closed system example if the iced tea were in a perfectly insulated thermos. Um, so here you can kind of see the comparison of those three types of systems. Um, a perfectly isolated system does not exist. So as you know, um, or we can't build it at least, because as you know, energy can always like even no matter how good of a thermos you get, for example, you're not going to be able to leave coffee, hot coffee in there, for example, and have it stay hot forever, right? It's always going to at some point cool down. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what is enthalpy? This is a word that I kind of mentioned at the beginning. So enthalpy, which we represent using this, um, this variable, so the variable we'll use when we start working with like equations, for example, in formulas is going to be H to represent enthalpy. And it's basically, it's a measure of the total energy that's stored in a chemical system. Um, now we mentioned that it's under constant pressure, um, just to be aware that, you know, we're looking at maintaining standard conditions, kind of the way um, in Chem 20, you would have talked a little bit about that with gas laws, right? Like if you want to measure one thing, you have to keep like say if you want to measure pressure, you need to keep volume and temperature constant. So same thing with um, enthalpy. If we're measuring it, we want to make sure that other components of the system are remaining constant. So we're basically looking at the total energy that's in a chemical system. So for this course, like so in Chem 30, whenever we're talking about enthalpy, just be aware that we're referring to only the potential energy. So that's the total energy we're looking at. If you remember different types of energy, so there's different types of um, potential energy, and one of those is chemical potential energy, which is the energy that's stored in like by the position of the bonds of different molecules. Um, and so just being aware that um, that's what we're talking about when we're looking at enthalpy. Okay, so what is the energy that's stored in these bonds? And then we're also going to be looking at some of the changes that happen due to that. So um, I have a little graph here that talks a little bit about what we're kind of looking at. Um, I kind of wish I would have picked a little bit of a different graph though, because actually we're going to, for the purposes of what we want to talk about right now, we're just going to ignore this activation energy section. Actually, I might just do that a little bit better. Okay. So we don't need to, <laughs> I am not doing good at drawing a straight line. Okay. So let's just kind of ignore this section here. Okay. So our main concern when we're looking at um, these graphs for now, if we're looking at the total energy of the system is we want to figure out what's the difference between basically the reactants and products. So if we kind of go into here and we look, we see that in this first example here, we have these reactants up here, right? So they're, and looking at the um, axes of the graph, we can see that they're higher up on the axis, the y-axis, which represents energy, which means that our reactants have a lot of energy stored within their bonds. Now, you can also kind of see down here on the x-axis that we have labeled it the reaction coordinate. So basically all that means is as we move from left to right across the graph, we kind of have a reaction happening, okay? And we see how the energy of the um, molecules changes as the reaction progresses. So here we have the reactants. Yes, there's an activation energy component here, but for enthalpy, the main thing we're concerned about is at the end of the reaction, we have these products down here. And so they're lower, which means that they are containing less energy in their bonds. So what we see happening is that in the shift from reactants to products, if the reactants had more energy and then the products have less, remember the law of conservation of energy says matter, or sorry, energy can't be created or destroyed. So then the change in energy, that less energy that we see in the products has to go somewhere and that's going to go to the surroundings. And so we can see that with this little arrow here that shows us our delta H, which is our change in enthalpy, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so basically what's happening here is we have, in this case, heat is being, heat 
which is a form of energy being released to the environment, right? Because there's less energy in the products than there were in the reactants. So that energy that is no longer required in the potential energy of the bonds is now released to the surroundings. So because that energy is being released to the environment, that means that's an exothermic reaction when we have energy being released. Alternatively, if we look at this next graph here, we have reactants starting out and we can see that they are quite low energy. They're low on the y-axis. As our reaction progresses, so as we move from left to right across this graph, we see that in the end we have these products that are higher on the y-axis, right? Which means that their bonds are storing more energy. So how can you go from something that has lower energy like less energy in its bonds to more energy in its bonds. Well, it has to get that energy from somewhere, and that is going to be, in this case, coming from the environment. So uh, basically, then we end up seeing um, the delta H here. I'm going to highlight that one with blue to show that it's going in, so that it's not exothermic. So we have energy being pulled in from the environment, and that is, um, sorry guys, my screen got a little bit messed up here. Okay, um, so it's being pulled in from the, ener uh, from the environment, so that means that our reaction is endothermic because energy is taken in, okay? So we just always remember exo means like exiting, and endo means into, like taking into. If you um, haven't already, so if you're watching this new, uh, you might want to pause really quickly and go to the link that's in your notes and watch this little video here um, that's like an introduction to thermochemistry and enthalpy, okay? So that will give you like a little bit of a um, better understanding. And actually he goes through like um, an actual demonstration of some of these concepts so you can actually see them happening um, you know, with real chemical reactions. So that's kind of cool. Okay, so maybe pause the video a second and watch that um, video if you're catching up. Otherwise, we're going to move on to enthalpy changes. So we kind of talked about what enthalpy is. It's that total energy of a system, but often we're dealing with the changes in enthalpy like we just saw in those graphs. So when we have an enthalpy change, we represent it with um, this delta, right, to represent change in. So whenever you see that triangle there, that always, we call it delta, and it means a change in. H is our enthalpy. Now, in the textbook, you'll find that they often put this X in there um, to represent that it's a change for a reaction. Um, personally, when I write it, I just write the delta H. Um, so you guys don't have to worry about putting in that little subscript there for now. We'll talk about cases where you do a little bit later on. So the enthalpy change of a chemical reaction is the change in potential energy that's stored in the bonds, which is basically just what we kind of were talking about with those graphs. Um, so it's looking at the comparison of the energy stored in the bonds of the reactants compared to the products. Sometimes we call this net energy um, because we're looking at Essentially, we're not really worried with like, what is the whole system of energy changes that happen? All we care about is where, how much energy was there to begin and how much energy is there um, at the end, right? And so we see that reflected in the formula here where the change in enthalpy is going to be equal to what was the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants, okay? Okay. So we basically are just looking at the difference between the end and the beginning. Okay. So for example, in an exothermic reaction, we see that the surroundings heat up, right? We know that when, like in a combustion uh, reaction, for example, which is exothermic, we know that we can anticipate there being heat. So that energy has to come from somewhere because remember our law of conservation of energy says that energy can't be um, created or destroyed. So, sorry guys, I'm trying to, oh, there we go. I was wondering why that changed. Okay, um, 
So it comes from the energy that's released when reactants with high energy bonds rearrange to form products with lower energy bonds. So this is specifically for exothermic. Remember, an endothermic would be the opposite. So if we look at what's happening in this graph here, the red line is what's showing with our chemical, is showing what's happening with our chemical system. So you can see that we start out up here. Um, our reactants are zinc with hydrochloric acid. And we see that together those um, reactants have a high amount of chemical energy, which is why they're located high up on the graph. As the reaction proceeds, we end up with the product down here, hydrogen gas and zinc chloride. And of course, because they're lower on the graph, that's telling us that they have less potential energy stored in, our, in their bonds. So as we kind of just talked about, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that... Um, the potential energy of our system decreases, right? So basically we see um, a decrease in our potential energy right here. Where is that energy going? If you remember back in, you know, like science 10, or if you've taken physics, you might remember that we look at different ways that energy is converted into different forms. And so just the same as like if you had a ball, you know, sitting up on a shelf and it rolls off and drops, it starts out with a lot of potential energy when it's high up on the shelf. And then as soon as it starts falling, it's losing potential energy and it's gaining kinetic energy, which means that it's moving faster, right? Because it's accelerating due to gravity. So the same kind of an idea is happening here with our chemical system which is that the potential energy of the bonds is decreasing to form these lower energy reactants. So that energy has to be going somewhere and it is going into kinetic energy in the surroundings. So in this particular case, um, you can see that the graph was basically saying that um, this reaction is taking place in water. Um, and you can see that because hydrochloric uh, acid is a solution, right? So the surroundings are water and it's low energy to begin with. But as this reaction proceeds, the potential energy that's being lost by the chemical bonds gets translated into kinetic energy for the surroundings, which is the water. And what does it mean when we have higher kinetic energy of a substance? It just means that those particles are moving more quickly, which means that we're changing into like changing levels of phases, right? Um, or changing temperature. So it means you're getting closer to um, whatever it might be, melting or boiling, um, or you're just like changing, like just increasing the temperature. Okay. Um, so that's just kind of looking at where that energy is going. We have three examples of where we can look at enthalpy changes happening. So the first one is a phase change. So in a phase change, we're looking at something changing states of matter. So basically changing between solid, liquid, and gas. Okay. And so what you need to kind of have a little bit of recollection of is way back in science 10 again, you would have looked at this thing called um, a water heating curve. Now, technically, so this graph that you see here, it will apply to any substance. Um, but for the purpose of this particular example, I'm going to pretend that this is for water because we all know pretty easily, um, like the melting point of water is zero degrees and the boiling point is 100 degrees. Okay, so essentially what we can see happening here is we're going to be going through some different phases. So just paying attention to what's happening on the axes. So we're looking at temperature changes on the y-axis and then on the x-axis we have heat which I feel like can be a little bit misleading because at this stage you might still be confusing temperature and heat a little bit. So just make sure you know that by heat we mean energy. And so this is where we are adding energy into the system. So as we move across the graph from left to right, we're adding energy in, and that is in some cases affecting the temperature and in others not. So if we look at this first section of the graph, so we're going from, uh, let me see, I'll grab a highlighter here. So we're going from, um, you know, a colder temperature and we're increasing our temperature because we're adding energy. In, at this point, all of the substance is still a solid. So if we're talking about water for this one, that means it's all ice. Once 
all of the ice is basically at zero degrees, that means it's reached its melting point where it's going to have enough energy to start relaxing the bonds between the molecules so that they can move into liquid form. So what happens there is we continue to put in energy because you can see that the graph is still going um, from like left to right. So that means energy is still increasing, but there's no vertical movement, right? So that means that the temperature is not increasing, even though we're continuing to add energy. So what is all that energy that we're adding doing? Well, it's basically going into like I said, relaxing those bonds between the molecules so that they can move from being a solid, where the molecules are quite close together and not, don't have a lot of movement, to having enough kinetic energy to move a little more freely, have more relaxed bonds, and behave like a liquid. Um, then again, if we, if we, so if we add energy to the point where now all of our substance is a liquid, once that happens, then the energy can go into, once again, increasing the temperature. So now we see the graph moving still from left to right, but also moving vertically because the temperature is increasing. That's going to happen until we reach the 100 degrees or the, phase, the next phase change. And then once we reach boiling point, so for water that's 100 degrees, we're going to see the graph flatten out again here because now, again, all the energy is going into, like, creating the kinetic energy that's required for those molecules to, you know, completely basically release their bonds. Because for basic, like for all intents and purposes, we kind of say that there is no um, real like bond activity happening between gas molecules, even though there is like a little bit. Now, if you had this in a contained system, so your gas wasn't just like, you're not just boiling water in a kettle and it's leaving off into the atmosphere. If you add it in a contained system and you continued to add energy, again, you would see that the temperature of the gas, once all of the material is a gas, you're going to see the temperature of the gas continuing to increase as you add more energy. Okay, so that's looking at enthalpy changes for, um, let's see, for uh, phase changes. The next example of an enthalpy change is the one that we'll mostly be looking at, which is chemical changes or chemical reactions. So this is basically what we were already talking about, that you have, you're putting in energy to um, like break bonds and rearrange bonds, or the, I guess I shouldn't say that. There's energy changes that are happening as bonds are broken and rearranged, and we'll look at the specific, specifics of that a little bit later in this lesson. Um, so there's energy changes that happen due to the changing of bonds. And um, the differences between those changes is what's going to result in um, what we see as either endothermic or exothermic reactions. So just keep in mind one of the reasons why we see these, um, we'll see that there's usually more energy involved in chemical reactions than there are in phase changes. And the reason for that is because of the differences in the strengths of bonds. So when we were looking at phase changes, what we were looking at breaking apart is the intermolecular forces. So keep in mind that this is the bond that exists between molecules. Um, so it's kind of like what attracts molecules to other molecules and helps them maintain their shape as like a solid or a liquid those forces are weaker than the intramolecular forces over here, which are like the forces that are holding this chlorine together with this hydrogen, okay? So the intramolecular forces are the ones that are actually holding the atoms together in the molecule, and those are stronger than the intermolecular forces, which is why most of us have the resources to, um, you know, boil water in our house, but we don't have the, the resources to um, break water apart into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, because that takes a lot more energy. So you need to use electrolysis in order to do that. Now, the highest form of energy change is going to come from nuclear changes. And actually, we don't look at this too much in um, Chemistry 30. This is pretty much it as far as I can remember from the last time I taught this. Um, but basically with nuclear changes, we're looking at um, the strongest force is the force that's holding together the, um, the nucleus, right? So 
um, we have all these different forces holding the protons and neutrons together. So when those forces are broken apart, because they are much, much stronger bonds than what we've looked at with phase changes and even with um, chemical changes, when changes happen in those, it's incredibly high energy. Um, so this is going to result in the largest amounts of energy um, that we see. Okay. Um, all right, let's look at molar enthalpy really quickly. So molar enthalpy, you'll see that we have this little um, shorthand version of it or like the formula, the variable version that we would write out. So again, we see that little triangle, delta. Um, so that's talking about the change in our molar enthalpy. You'll see that there's a little subscript after the triangle, which just, it stands for little r. And basically that's just saying that this could be the change for any reaction. And we'll look a little bit later on because often we actually specify the type of reaction. So we put in a different subscript than just little r. Um, then we have capital H, which represents our enthalpy. But in order to know that it's molar enthalpy, we put in that little subscript M. Okay, so just be aware that this is kind of our standard notation for molar enthalpy. And molar enthalpy is basically looking at the change in enthalpy when we have one mole of a particular substance. So we're always applying this to one specific substance and it's undergoing a specified reaction. So usually we're looking at combustion, formation, or decomposition. And we'll look at that in a little more detail in a bit. So we measure molar enthalpy. Um, so just the way we measured enthalpy in joules or kilojoules, we measure um, molar enthalpy in joules per mole or kilojoules per mole. So basically it's saying how much energy in joules or kilojoules does this substance have um, in one mole of it? Okay, you can find standard molar enthalpies um, for various substances on pages four and five of your data booklet. I can't remember if, oh yeah. So here in your data booklet, um, you can find there's like the standard molar enthalpies. You'll notice that it says standard molar enthalpies of formation. So all of these are referring to um, the molar enthalpy that you would find from their formation reaction. Um, so for example, like if you were looking at um, butane, I don't know why I can't get it to highlight it. It doesn't want to highlight it. Okay. Um, so if you were looking at butane though, for example, which hopefully you can see it, I'll move it so it's like right up at the top there. C4H10. So basically, and then you see that the molar enthalpy is negative 125.7 kilojoules per mole. So basically that's saying if you had one mole of butane formed in a react formation reaction, so basically carbon and hydrogen gas react to form butane, then the one mole of butane that got formed would, um, let's see, release 125.7 kilojoules of energy for that mole. Okay, um, but you'll you'll probably pick up a little bit more on that when we um, start doing calculations how that works. Um, so we've expressed lots of other quantities per mole that you should be familiar with from um, like, for example, science 10 is when we first started looking at molar mass. So we were looking at if we had the mass of a substance and we have our molar mass, then we can convert between those two things. So molar mass was looking at how many grams are there in one mole of the substance. We also looked at in Chem 20, when you did solutions, you would have looked at mo uh, molar volume. So basically this is saying how many liters of um, solution are there per mole of substance. And then the last one, so we've looked at enthalpy change now, we're adding on a new molar unit in Chem 30, which is how much energy is there per mole of substance, okay? Um, in terms of doing calculations, um, we can calculate molar enthalpy using the reaction that, or sorry, the formula that you see here. So we have the enthalpy change of the reaction, um, which is represented by this delta H, so our change in enthalpy. So that's telling us how much energy was gained or lost by the whole system. And we can calculate that by multiplying the chemical amount of the substance that we're um, examining. So how many moles of that substance and multiplying it by 
the molar enthalpy of that substance. So how much energy per mole of that substance um, is absorbed or released. Okay, so basically that should tell you that depending on how much of a substance there is, we're going to see more energy being, like if you have more of a substance, you're going to see more energy being absorbed or released. And if you have less, you'll have less, which kind of makes sense because like, even if you think about like, if you were having, um, if you wanted to have a fire, for example, right? If you have two little sticks to burn, you know, you're not going to be putting out a lot of heat. Whereas if you have like a giant pile of wood to burn, you know that you can release a lot of energy. So that's basically exactly what this um, formula is kind of telling us. Okay. Um, so we see that these changes in energy are proportional to the number of moles. So basically that means, like we say down here, if you double the number of moles of a substance, with a given molar enthalpy, then the enthalpy change um, also doubles. Okay, so they're proportionally related to each other. I did also put in a little bit of a side note here, this learning tip from your textbook, um, to just kind of be aware that the strategies you've used for, um, like a lot of times, I'll probably be talking to you guys a lot as we go through Chem 30 about conversion factors. Hopefully you've used them before. Um, but like you would have known already about calculating like grams to moles by using grams per mole as a, um, like as a conversion factor. Um, in this case, they're just showing you the formulas, but I'll be working more with conversion factors, but you can see how the math is consistent for all of them and it makes sense, right? So if you wanted to solve for mass, you multiply moles by grams per mole. If you wanted to solve for volume, you multiply moles by liters per mole. And the same thing is true for energy. So if you want to calculate um, the energy of a system, then you multiply moles by kilojoules per mole. And always basically what's happening with these is that they're canceling out, right? So like if we have moles, oh, I feel like my pen is kind of, oh, my pen is going really slow. Sorry guys, I just have to take one quick second restart this because anytime it does this, um, it always ends up taking a long time. Okay, um, where was I? Yeah, so if we do like moles times by, for example, if we're looking at energy, kilojoules per mole, think about what happens with the unit. So moles times by something divided by moles, whenever you divide something out, it cancels out, right? So that's why we're left with kilojoules in the end. So basically you can see from all of these formulas that whenever we multiply by a fraction that has moles on the bottom, um, or we multiply moles by something with fraction that has moles on the bottom, we always end up with just the unit that's on the top of that fraction. So in this case, that's kilojoules. Um, okay, really quickly here, endothermic changes. So if we have energy going into the system, that means um, it's really important for you guys to remember that we're always, when we're talking about enthalpy, we're always referring to the system. So if energy is going into the system, relative to the system, that means the system is having like an increase in its enthalpy, right? An increase in energy. So for endothermic reactions, we say that it has positive enthalpies because it's gaining energy from the surroundings, okay? Versus like if the surroundings were our reference point, we would say the surroundings have negative enthalpy because they'd be giving their energy to the reaction. So just be aware that we're always referring to the system when we're talking about enthalpy. So you always have to determine whether it's positive or negative based on the system and not the surroundings. So with endothermic, it's pulling energy in, which means energy is gained. And so that would be positive. Okay. And so then of course, exothermic changes because the system is losing energy to the surroundings, which is why it feels warmer around it. That means that we say the enthalpy for the reaction is negative. And that's because this system gave energy to the surroundings. Okay. Um, in terms of bond breaking and formation, um, you should be aware of the, 
kind of like rules for this. So always in order to break bonds, energy needs to be put in. And a lot of times students get confused with this because um, if you've taken any biology, you've probably heard the whole time about how ATP, we break ATP, adenosine triphosphate, into ADP, adenosine diphosphate. And um, basically what we always, or a lot of times is told in biology is we break ATP into ADP and that's how the cell gets energy. But the reality is that when we look at gaining energy from a reaction, we're looking at the difference between the energy that's required to break the bonds and the energy that's released by the formation of bonds. So energy is required to break bonds, but it is released by the formation of bonds. So this is always true. You have to put energy in to break the bonds and it's released by the formation of bonds. So then you might wonder, well, how do we get exothermic and endothermic reactions if you have to put energy in to break the bonds, right? Well, it's the difference between those two because usually the amount of energy for breaking bonds and formation of bonds is not equal. So the relative amount will help us to determine whether a reaction is exothermic or endothermic. So for example... Um, let's see, if we look at this little reaction we have here on the right, okay, so if we have this amount of energy being absorbed to break the bonds in the reactants, okay, let's say, I don't know, we could just assign it an arbitrary number like 10 joules, just to make it easy. Then, um, so 10 joules is absorbed in order to break the bonds. When energy is released by the bond formation, oop, I wanted to make that uh, my highlighter. When energy is released, let's say that it's only eight joules that gets released. So overall, what's the difference between these two? 10 joules was absorbed from the environment to break bonds in, re in the reaction. And only eight joules was released when the products were formed. So that means that we have a net amount of energy that was absorbed. So basically, out of the 10 joules that got absorbed to break the bonds, only eight joules was created by the formation of bonds. So a total of two joules was absorbed and not replaced by the energy released um, when bonds form in products. So then we notice that as a change in the surroundings because there's a deficit of energy in the surroundings because of that. Then, of course, the opposite happens here if we're looking at an exothermic reaction, which is where we have a certain amount of energy is being absorbed. We could always just say it's basically the opposite. So let's say, because we can see this is less. So let's say eight joules of energy is absorbed to break the bonds in the reactants. And then um, in terms of energy being released, we see here that it's a greater amount. So let's just say that that is 10 joules. So if 10 joules of energy is released when the bonds form, but only eight joules had to be absorbed um, in order to make the reaction happen, then we have a net amount of energy being released into the environment um, because more energy is released from the, from the products being formed. So that means we have two joules of energy that's being released to the environment instead of absorbed. So that's why we feel it as heat. Okay, so we have the little summary of this here. With an exothermic reaction, we have a small amount of energy being absorbed and a large amount of energy being released. And so because more energy is released, overall we detect that in the environment as a release of energy, even though some energy has still been absorbed. With an endothermic reaction, a large amount of energy is absorbed in order to break the bonds, and only a small amount of energy is released by the formation of bonds. So overall, we detect in the environment that energy has been absorbed. Okay. All right, so you guys have a little summary of all of that information here. Um, so make sure to kind of have a look at that. There are also one thing that I'm not going to go into too much detail about now, um, just being aware of some of the different types of everyday reactions we see that are exothermic versus endothermic. Um, this is commonly asked on like tests and stuff like that. So combustion would be an exothermic reaction. So is cellular respiration because we release 
like it releases energy. That's why we use it for energy. Um, versus like an endothermic would be like ice packs. Um, if you watched that video that I had linked earlier in the notes, um, he kind of shows that idea a little bit. Photosynthesis also, because it needs to absorb solar energy, is an endothermic reaction. Okay, and you can also see the typical kind of style of graph that we see for both of those types of reactions. Last thing before we wrap up is just symbols used to represent reactions. So like I mentioned, um, up until now, we kind of like when we were looking at our um, representations, we had delta RH, right, or delta RHM, which was just saying that the change for a given reaction, which we represent with R to be more generic, um, the change in enthalpy for a given reaction or the change in molar enthalpy for a given reaction. A lot of times, because it depends on what kind of a reaction is happening, is going to affect how we calculate enthalpy. So you do need to kind of pay attention to, like, if you were looking at enthalpy of formation, you're going to see this little F. So if you look in this chart on the right-hand side, you'll see all the... Um, the abbreviation. So F is for formation, C is for combustion, D is for decomposition. Those are the main ones we'll be looking at. A little bit later on in the unit we'll look at heat of solution as well, but we're not going to get into that just yet. Um, so just make sure you pay attention when you look at your, um, you know, your, I don't know what you call it, symbols I guess. Um, just make sure you pay attention to that little subscript to determine what kind of a reaction um, the author is referring to. Okay, so that's it for today. Next time we're going to look at going through some of these examples where we kind of um, figure out how to do some calculations with this information. So I will see you then.